We're continuing our studies this morning on some of those areas of Christ our righteousness and justification by faith that seem to cause misunderstanding and misinterpretation. I've entitled the one today, But What Can I Do? One of the problem areas that concern us very much is what is man's capability? What is our potential? What are we able to do and what are we not able to do? There has to be a beginning place in our experience. Can man obey the law and become righteous? There's much disagreement about this. I'll not answer it all today by any means. Will striving and self-discipline and strenuous effort produce a righteous life which God can accept and approve? Doesn't God command us to work and to strive? Now, there's a deception involved in these questions concerning ourselves because it's so difficult for us to see ourselves. So often we judge ourselves by what other people are like. And if we're doing a little better than they are, well, everything must be all right. But the Lord doesn't worry about what other people think. Uh, his concern is, what does he think? And the righteousness has to do with him and his concepts of this. And he writes very, very much about it for us. So I want to survey several people in the Bible to give you some understanding of what we are like and how the Lord deals with us concerning these questions. Among the most righteous people of Christ's day, at least regarded by the general public, were the members of the Sanhedrin. They were the highest, the most elite. One of those men was Nicodemus, and he came to Christ at night. And he didn't ask him a question. He came with these things in John chapter 3, the first two verses. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Either Christ didn't hear him or didn't wish to hear him, because he steered him a different direction. He looked at his heart, and he'd been thinking about this man a long time. And so he responds in chapter 3 and verse 3. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He's telling Nicodemus some things that he cannot have, and he cannot do. And this is a surprise to this man who seems to be able to do so many things, and now he finds out there's something that from which he's omitted. In the book, Desire of Ages, page 171, it talks about him and this experience, this conversation that he and Christ had. Nicodemus had heard the preaching of John the Baptist concerning repentance and baptism and pointing the people to one who should baptize with the Holy Spirit. He himself had felt that there was a lack of spirituality among the Jews, that to a great degree they were controlled by bigotry and worldly ambition. He had hoped for a better state of things at the Messiah's coming. Yet the heart-searching message of the Baptist had failed to work in him conviction of sin. He was a strict Pharisee and prided himself on his good works. He was widely esteemed for his benevolence and his liberality in sustaining the temple service. And he felt secure of the favor of God. And so he went to the service on Sabbath. He was at perfect peace, total complacency. He was a very liberal giver, secure, prided his own works. He felt secure in the favor of God, nothing to bother him. And now Jesus irritates him, so to speak. He was startled at the thought of a kingdom too pure for him to see in his present state. His questions that follow, how can you be born the second time? Now, this is an intellectual person asking these absurd questions. And it shows how flabbergasted he was. He was just startled out of his normal composure. And the Lord startled him on purpose. He wanted this man to see something that he could not see, apparently in his present condition. So he was startled at the thought of a kingdom too pure for him to see in that condition. Now, this was hard on Nicodemus. It's hard on everyone to suddenly find out that you've been falsely secure. We don't like to hear those words. And so you get uneasy at some of these thoughts. Christ spoke to him that way. He wasn't denouncing the man. He wasn't critical, was he? No, he wasn't pointing the finger at him. He just said, except you're born again, you can't get inside. Christ operates so tenderly, so kindly, in comparison to us. There's another statement about him in volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 219. Many are not sensible to their condition. We may flatter ourselves, as did Nicodemus, that our moral character has been correct. And we need not humble ourselves before God like the common sinner. But we must be content to enter into life in the very same way as the chief of sinners. We must renounce our righteousness and plead for the righteousness of Christ for our strength. Self must die. We must acknowledge that all we have is from exceeding riches of divine grace. 
He's a very unusual person. If he were alive today and went to Vienna this coming week, they would probably elect him to be General Commerce President. And everyone would say back home, Amen. They elected the right man, Nicodemus. He's very happy about it, I believe, because there's nothing discernible about him that would seem to say he was not ready for heaven. But Jesus said to this man, Except you're born again, you aren't going to make it. An esteemed leader by all the people, a very righteous man, even of the righteous Sanhedrin, the Bible tells about another man somewhat like him. By the way, there's another text on this, Matthew 5, verse 20. I'd like to put together with these thoughts on Nicodemus. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. If your righteousness isn't any better than theirs, you're not going to get in either. He told Nicodemus, you won't make it unless you're born again. You're not good enough. He says the rest of us and the rest of his disciples, if you're not better than they are, you won't get in either. Better than the righteous Pharisees and the righteous scribes. And that sort of eliminated everybody according to the people's judgment. And he didn't mean to be discouraging. He meant them to discern the true meaning of righteousness. And to judge righteousness by a different criteria than we had in the past. Another man who appeared very righteous, who felt that God had approved him, was Isaiah the Gospel prophet. And he felt approved until Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5. And there it talks about his attitudes after he saw the purity of the Lord high and lifted up in the temple. Isaiah 6, 5. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. Now Isaiah was a different kind of fellow. He was a prophet. He was blessed of the Lord. And he thought he was safe. In the book, The Faith I Live By, a morning watch book for several years gone by, page 190. As the prophet Isaiah beheld the glory of the Lord, he was amazed and overwhelmed with a sense of his own weakness and unworthiness, and he cried, Woe is me! Isaiah had denounced the sins of others, but now he sees himself exposed to the same condemnation he had pronounced upon them. He had been satisfied with a cold, lifeless ceremony in his worship of God. He had not known this until the vision was given him of the Lord. How little now appeared his wisdom and talents as he looked upon the sacredness and majesty of the sanctuary. His view of himself might be expressed in the language of the Apostle Paul. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So here's an apparently very righteous man, a prophet, whom God had called to tell other people, you know, what was wrong with them. And now as he sees the purity of the Lord in the temple, he himself finds that there are many, many bad spots in his character. He said, I'm all undone. Everything is wrong. He was amazed and upset by this, just like Nicodemus. And he began to sense that there was something in him that he thought he only found in the people, that he was home safe. And now he had these suspicions and doubts that he wasn't in that condition. Another man of whom the Jews were greatly envious was, was Moses. He had a marvelous deliverance from the time he was born, training by his mother, a very godly person, grew up in the home of Pharaoh. And this man, who seemed to have such an excellent beginning, thought that he was going to deliver God's people and that it was a righteous act to go out and start killing Egyptians. And so he did. When he found out he was discovered, he became frightened and fled for his very life. And Pharaoh found out about it and he started looking for his life. And then this very wonderful man, who seemed to be very righteous, spent 40 long years herding sheep in order to eradicate some deeply embedded problems in his life. Can you imagine uh, 40 years getting rid of something in your character? We emulate him and envy him for having led his people for 40 long years, you know, and going through all those trials there in the wilderness and delivering them to Egypt. But just imagine 40 years with sheep. What kind of education is that? But Moses attempted to lead God's people as a general, which most of us do, commanding and manhandling and dictating and using arms and weapons of all kinds. He thought that's the way to do it. Just tell them to jump and they all jump or you shoot them. And the Lord said, no, come on along, Moses. You can't afford to kill too many sheep, you know. You'll starve to death after a while. That's your livelihood. Your job is to keep the sheep alive, not kill them off. It's a different story. And imagine 40 long years to discover and eradicate some of these spots in his character. Now, this is a very godly person. We think highly of him, but we don't ever stop to think, you know, God spent a long time getting him ready. And there was something back there that he had to get rid of before he became the leader of Israel. Another great man in Israel is found in 1 Samuel, 
uh, chapter 10. We usually talk about all the bad things about this man, but the Bible tells about some marvelous good things about him, and I'd like you to see those first and put the bad things in perspective with them. First Samuel 10, we want to read verses 6 and 9 to begin. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. Talking about King Saul. He'll be turned into another person, another man. The fulfillment of that took place in verse 9. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. I've left out the signs that are mentioned here. He became another man with a new heart, a converted person. God took care of that. Uh, when he was finally proclaimed king, you notice the words they spoke about him in verses 22 to 24 of the same chapter. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further if the man should yet come thither. The Lord announced, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. He's a humble person. So it says they went and pulled him out. They ran and fetched him thence. When he stood among the people, he was higher than any other people from his shoulders and upward. He was over a head taller than any other people round about of the whole nation. And the last verse says, 24, And Samuel said to all the people, See ye of him, see him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. A born-again Christian, right? I'll make you another man. He gave him a different heart. This was King Saul. How long has it been since you read those words? All we can remember are the bad things he did, you know. He had an amazing beginning. Considered by all the people as the most righteous. That's why God chose him. He was a very special leader, a very godly man. Yet this is the man who for all those years tried to kill David because he was jealous of him. And a man of such stature and prominence and prestige, how could he have any peer pressures? And yet he was. He's very envious and tried to kill him. Worse still, Saul was made a prophet. When you put that in the context of the rest of his life, that's significant. Verses 10 and 11 of chapter 10. When they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. King Saul. It came to pass when that all that knew him before time saw that, Behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that has come the, under the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Now when you put that with his last acts in his life where he went down to the witch of Ender, to the devil's messenger or prophet, to find out what God would tell him to do. The man with his own eyes had seen the visions and heard the voice of God as a prophet. Turned his back on that, years later went to the devil's spokesman and said, What does God want me to do? You see, his experience had not been that of a prophet. If he hadn't witnessed it his, with his own senses, his own mind, it might not have been so bad to go down to the Witch of Ender. But you see, you have certain responsibilities and accountability when you have been a prophet of God. And imagine him going to the devil's prophet. It's unbelievable. What was there in Saul's heart, that new heart, that could cause him to do these things? Did he know his own heart? If you'd told him he got the witch of Ender ten years before, he would have laughed and laughed, wouldn't he? If you told him he'd try to kill David, he would deny it. Over and over again. He would never believe that. None of these men would believe some of the things the Bible tells about him in retrospect. Israel's greatest king was called a man after God's own heart. Who was that? David. You read about him in Acts thirteen twenty two and first Samuel thirteen fourteen. Surely he must have been a very righteous man. He ruled Israel in its heyday, so to speak. He was God's own man for that time. Yet lurking inside of him was the potential to commit that act of adultery with Bathsheba and then plan to have her husband murdered to excuse his own sin. There was no one that thought could David could do a thing like that at all. Had you tried to tell him beyond, before that time, he wouldn't believe it at all. Yet there was something in David, in that righteous person, as you might call him, that caused some of these problems. There was an inward corruption and he seemed to sense this perhaps more than any other Bible writer as he wrote about his own experience in that famous prayer, Psalm 51. And there in verse 10, you know it so well. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He knew that on the inside he must have been defiled or these thoughts and these ideas could never have emanated from him. He said, Lord, change the whole inside. Transform me entirely. I need it. And this is this wonderful man saying this. Some of the most obvious cases like these are found in the disciples of Jesus. 
and they're amazing men. And the three most prominent of all the disciples were Peter, James, and John. Ellen White says they're with him at all the miracles he performed. So for that entire three and a half years, they had the most intimate relationship with Jesus. Now, when you find among them some of these same problems, I mean, when you see Jesus, when you live with him, when you hear him every day, when you sleep with him, when you eat with him, when you walk with him, when you work with him, it's different, isn't it? And yet, what were these men like? You find about James and John in Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to 22. They're called the sons of Zebedee, and so you understand that term here. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children, with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand, the other on thy left, in thy kingdom. And Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? To baptize with the baptism I am baptized with? They say unto him, the two sons, where they came with her, if you look in verse 20, they say unto him, we are able. Tell us what to do and we'll jump. How foolish they were. They did not understand their own hearts. They didn't understand this cup and this baptism. They didn't understand the terrible suffering, the persecution, the ordeals and the trial, or they would never have said we are able. You see, if the greatest act of righteousness was the crucifixion of Jesus, you see, there was more love in that one act than you can find anything else in your whole the whole experience of the Bible. And love is the filling of the law. God is love and his character is written down in that law. And righteous obedience to the law. Then the sufferings on Calvary were the greatest act of obedience you can possibly find. When you put those sufferings together and that sacrifice, you get a whole different concept of righteousness. It isn't trying to avoid telling lies about somebody or keeping from hating someone, you know, or coveting what they have or lusting or anything. It isn't that at all. That's such a, a juvenile understanding of righteousness. Righteousness is that one act of Jesus. There you see the ultimate example hanging there on Calvary's cross. And these men were righteous because of the things they suffered for Christ and for you and me. We say, Lord, anything but suffering and humiliation. Anything. And we stand around and I pride and say, my, I'm so thankful I'm not like other people are. And we call that righteousness. And how different is the demonstration of righteousness found in Jesus. And somehow we must go back and see how wrong they were when they said, we are able. And he was saying, you don't understand. We will do anything you say. And he said, you don't know what you're asking for and what's going to happen to you. You don't quite understand this. When you say so glibly, we are able. They were not able. Not at all. How little they knew their own hearts. Now, the most obvious and glaring case is that of Peter. You know it very well, but let's review it in Mark 14, verses 27 to 31. And Peter is an amazing person. And we identify with him because he's so much like us. And I hope you keep identifying with him with these verses. Because I think it helps us to understand us as we look at Peter. 27 to 31. And Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, meaning the other disciples, yet will not I. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that this day, even this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he, meaning Peter, spake the more vehemently. Remember now he's arguing with Christ. He spoke the more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. Peter is an amazing person. How could he say this so strongly? How could he dispute with the God of heaven walking among men? When you start talking about Peter's deficiencies, he would fight with you. Don't we? Easy. Just automatic to us. We just get belligerent right now. You talk about our deficiencies. We begin to defend ourselves in our own righteousness. We try to establish our own righteousness. Page 673 and 4, Desire of Ages, is this marvelous bit of quotation about Peter's experience. When Peter said he would follow his Lord to prison and to death, he meant it, every word of it, but he did not know himself. So our sincerity will not prevent us from having deception in our hearts. Hidden in his heart were elements of evil that circumstances would fan into light. You ever notice that? Everything's going along fine in your life until the wrong set of circumstances come about. Then what do you do? Just collapse. You ever find yourself in a certain social environment, 
saying all the dirty jokes everybody else is saying, <laughs> laughing at all the things you thought you'd never laugh at again, you know, becoming just as worldly as everybody else, you thought you shouldn't do that. Just the right set of circumstances of what happens to all our pretense. We just fold up, don't we? Just collapse, and all our rights have just suddenly gone out the window. Certain elements of evil, that circumstance would fan into life. Unless he was made conscious of this danger, these would prove his eternal ruin. The Savior saw in him a self-love and assurance that would overbear even his love for Christ. Nowadays, we teach people, you must have self-love. Christ said that's Peter's most dangerous, vulnerable point. We say that you must love one another as you love yourself, so you can't love others. They love yourself. Haven't heard that preached, have you, lately? We talk about it all the time. We talk about self-worth, self-achievement, pride in self. This was Peter's hang-up. It says the Lord saw in him self-love and assurance that would overbear even his love for Christ. You must be very careful about some of these things and understanding of them. Much of infirmity, of unmortified sin, carelessness of spirit, unsanctified temper, heedlessness and entering into temptation had been revealed in his experience. Already revealed, you see. Christ's solemn warning was a call to heart searching. He wasn't condemning. He wasn't accusing. So Peter, take a look. Peter needed to distrust himself and to have a deeper faith in Christ. But he didn't. What was his response? If you continue reading that same paragraph, page 674, it says, but Peter felt that he was distrusted by Jesus. Misunderstood. He felt he was distrusted. And he thought it cruel. He was already offended. And he became more persistent in his self-confidence. And he became more self-confident than he was before. He's already too self-confident. Now he becomes more extreme than ever. Peter was like that. And sometimes, you know, the best help the Lord gives us only exaggerates our weak points. You can see it in others, but you can't see it in yourself. And I can't see it in myself either. The best help he gives us sometimes just entrenches us as we seek to defend ourselves, our pride of opinion, our justification of self and all our acts. We are so certain so often. We say we are able, like James and John. And how reluctant we are to say we're unable. The Lord said, except you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom. And a little child is always saying, Mommy, Daddy, I can't. Show me how. I don't know how. Help me. What do we say? I am able. Tell me what it is. I can do it. I can fulfill all righteousness. There are some who sense their terrible inability and don't even want to try. And there are some who are always saying, I'm able. We have all these classes, there's no doubt, and everything in between. But so often, you know, we repeatedly say, I can do it, just tell me what to do. And we think, you know, we are doing it. But don't speak to our loved ones. They know our hypocrisy. And they're sweet enough not to say too much about it. Or we'd have to all leave and separate, wouldn't we? But they see the phoniness, the facade that we put up, the smoke screen. Difference in church than we are at home, you know, and difference of the job than there and all these things. They know about these things. They listen to us pray there and at home we don't even pray. Uh, many, many things that they see in us that are understood very carefully by children and by spouses. The Bible has many examples of people who didn't know themselves. And how the Lord in his divine grace and his sweet way tried to not expose, that's to other people, but tried to reveal to their inmost souls the corruption that was there and the changes he'd like to make for them on their behalf if they'd only let him. But we're proud, aren't we? Peter wasn't the only one. We'd make him a showpiece someplace and go look at him if he's the only one. But there are thousands, even millions just like Peter and like James and John and David and Saul and Moses. You can go on and on. Nicodemus and Isaiah. And the Bible is filled with many, many cases like these. Some of them learned by the revelation of God to their souls. Some of them never did learn. And some of us will never learn. Not because the Lord doesn't try. Not because He doesn't love us. And not that because He doesn't try repeatedly. For He never gives up. But just that we will not let self be exposed. We do not want to see ourselves, do we? And we take it as extreme criticism when people begin to discuss with us very kindly about what's inside and what protrudes. And we never seem to outgrow this. One of the marks of a healthy Christian is an honesty with self. When you take every statement about self and you carefully weigh it and meditate upon it and say, is that person really telling me the truth about myself? 
And a really well-adjusted Christian doesn't get hung up on that because there's something wrong on the inside. They expect to find something wrong inside. Is that a new idea? Did you think you were so holy and perfect you know you never find anything wrong? Are you so afraid of what's wrong that you think it'll be lost? You know the Lord knew all these things about us before he died for us. He still died for us, didn't he? It doesn't matter how bad you are. He still would die for your sins, wouldn't he? It doesn't matter. And there's nothing there so horrible that's going to cause you to be lost. He just wants to take care of it. And we're frightened that he's going to find some terrible thing. I've watched people take personality tests. And they falsify the answers so they can't find out what you're like on the inside. This doesn't make sense. You know, there's nothing so terrible or startling there. We're just human beings and human beings are like us. And being like us is being sinful and having a lot of problems like Moses had and like Saul had and David had and Nicodemus had and Peter and James and John. Yet they're the apostles and prophets. How can you get any higher than they are? And the Lord came to expose to them, not to others, their inmost souls. We need to know. And then we'll not think ourselves so righteous. And this would be a great blessing to us when that happens. Instead, we chase the blessing away sometimes. We think we're different. Watch us sometimes in our Sabbath school classes. You notice these discussions, how we always try to prove the other fellow wrong, to advertise that we're right, that we have a greater Bible knowledge than anybody else in the class? Adventists love to do this. We do it with none Adventists. And we say, how come they don't like us and come to our church? I showed them, you know, the truth. How did you show them? Proving they were wrong. Every time. And then you say, we love our brother as Jesus loved us. Always showing them where they're wrong. And proud of our knowledge. In this I detect something like James and John. A desire to be preeminent. First in the kingdom. In knowledge. Somehow Adventists feel safe if they're always right. If you can always prove it. The Jews could prove they were right and they were lost. And they're even wrong about the Messiah. You know, we must be so careful about this being right and calling that righteousness. We must be very careful about the idea of being first in the kingdom. That's not the way. The first in the kingdom are those who serve the meek and lowly ones. Now, in all of this, we are certain that we believe in Christ as our righteousness. That we live according to that truth. And yet Christ our righteousness teaches, I live by faith in the rightness of another. In the righteousness of another. And not by faith in myself. And yet in this self-confidence I'm establishing I do not have faith in his righteousness, but I'm trying to have faith in my own. And we would claim that we're believers in Christ as our righteousness. And say, oh yes, I believe that, and I live that way. I've always believed that. And yet we're a thousand miles from it. In Romans chapter 10, he said, they're going about to establish their own righteousness, being ignorant of God's righteousness. So as soon as you try to make yourself righteous, you're ignorant of his. Righteousness by faith in another, not by confidence in self. It always has been that way. The greatest truth we have to discover is the truthfulness about self in Isaiah 64, 6. And I wish you'd read this with me and read it over and over when you get home as you have time to think about it. Isaiah 64, 6. Now, I'm talking about truthfulness for self, not a general truth of a statement. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. I've always believed this for the world, haven't you? And I've always believed this for most people. But I didn't believe it for me. That my righteousness are just dirty rags. That's a different truth, isn't it? It's easy for you to apply it to your spouse or your children or somebody else, you know, or a friend. But does this mean you? And you say, no, it doesn't mean me. The Bible doesn't qualify it. There's another statement like this that's just as difficult to accept in a personal way, and that's Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your heart doesn't deceive me. My heart doesn't deceive you. I'm like an open book to you, and you're like an open book to me. But my heart deceives me, and your heart deceives you. And believe me, we're always being tricked. It almost never ceases. We make many assumptions that are a thousand miles from the truth about self. I don't want you to just become a suspicious person. But distrust of self can be a healthy thing. But uh, we always go along suspicion of the other person, you know. That fellow just, he doesn't do things right. He doesn't treat me right. We get into problems with several different people. We never realize that lightning is hitting me 16 different times, you know, from 16 different sources. Something must be wrong with me. 
We say, all those people out there are mistreating me. That's what we call a paranoid. No, they're not mistreating you. There's something wrong with you. It's your attitude. The heart is deceitful, and I don't understand it. And it deceives me. But I go along assuming that I'm doing all right by looking at other aspects of my life and forgetting all about the things that seem to be wrong here. Now, we fail to see our deceptions because we're so prone to look at outward acts of the hands and the feet and the lips and the eyes. And we almost never take a look at the motives. Why do we go to church on Sabbath? Why do we pay tithe? Why do we feel we ought to do missionary work? Why do we feel we ought to stop doing that particular activity or sin or whatever it is? Why do you feel guilty about not doing that or about doing it? Why? As long as we're content with external activities that seem right, well, we go along quite complacent. We begin to look why and you begin to see there's something wrong inside. So we don't see our own selfishness because we don't look at motives. The Lord is constantly trying to bring us an awareness, a consciousness, a realization of us internally. Always trying to do this. And we have problems nowadays. We keep fending him off. And saying, talking about anything you wish, but I don't want to hear about that. Please don't talk about me. Please don't meddle. It bothers me. It seems that we're just desperate for Christian survival in our justification of self. We're just frightened that something terrible is going to happen to us if something is found wrong with us. Why do we assume there's nothing wrong with us? Or why do we assume that everything will be all right if we don't hear about it? The Bible writer with the greatest understanding of this, and the one who's written the most about it, is the Apostle Paul. And he had the greatest difficulty because while trying to kill off the Christian church, he thought he was serving God. What greater deception could that be? So this is the man who wrote these strange words found in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Now you say, but I'm not one of those people. Therefore, I'm not nothing. We deceive ourselves. Be careful of reasoning you follow about this verse. You'll get entangled every time. If we think ourselves to be something when we're nothing, we deceive ourselves. And we say, you know, you really just come along and hit us awfully hard. No, I didn't write that. A man of great understanding and tremendous experience in a close walk with God was inspired to write this. He'd already applied it to himself. He said, I am the chief of sinners, First Timothy 1.15. This was not an idle boast. He knew that. Paul was really a very humble, meek man when you correctly read his writings. That God would use him after all the terrible things he did in persecuting the church. He was utterly amazed. He wrote those marvelous words where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. He'd experienced that. They were precious to him. He knew he was the worst of all sinners. Who could do what he had done? So he worried about this, he said, and don't take any confidence in these things. And he also wrote Philippians 3, verse 3. The last phrase especially. And have no confidence in the flesh. Why do we trust ourselves? Why do we have confidence in what we think or what we can do or what we can say? Why? He said, have no confidence in the flesh when you really understand what self is like. When God reveals it to you, you don't place so much confidence in self. You put your confidence in Him. Faith in Him and His righteousness. Now, this was the emphasis back in 1880 when Christ our righteousness began to be preached. Read Wagner's book on the glad tidings. Over and over again he mentions this. No confidence in the flesh. And he emphasizes nothingness of man, which we now abhor, and which we teach opposite in most churches nowadays. In the book Christ our righteousness, page 104, when men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. This is preparation. Page 38. The burden of our message should be the mission and the life of Jesus Christ. And everyone says, Amen. But let me read the rest. Let there be a dwelling upon the humiliation, self-denial, meekness, and lowliness of Christ, that proud, selfish hearts may see the difference between themselves and the pattern and may be humbled. And then no amens, right? The dwelling upon the humiliation and self-denial of Jesus. We don't like to think about that very much. Testimony of the Ministers, page 456. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. It's a humiliating experience. Volume 7 of the Testimonies, page 17. And she always gives us hope. Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible. Notice the contradiction. 
Nothing apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible, than the soul that feels this nothingness and relies wholly on the merits of the Savior. God would send every angel in heaven to the aid of such an one rather than allow him to be overcome. He'd empty heaven for just one person who senses his own nothingness. In the Bible, there's an experience that I almost never hear talked about, and it has to do with this lesson today. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 43. It's also found in Ezekiel 36, 31, if you'd like to read, like to read it later. And there shall you remember your ways and all your doings when you've been defiled, and you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all your evils that you have committed. Someday, all of us will have a revelation of self. The Lord does not want to display your weakness nor mine, your sinfulness nor mine. That's not his way. He has a tender, loving, compassionate way. He's most long-suffering. He understands that we're but flesh. He's able to succor us because he became human, very weak as we are. He understands us. And he knows these problems of dealing with self. He knows how defensive we can be. But he knows that we must see ourselves before we really want him. Do you know that? We don't need him. We're too good to need him. And some are too bad to ever have him. This problem in Christ our righteousness is one of the most severe in the Adventist church today that it's ever been. As older members see the laxness, if I may call it that, of young people, they become even more critical of the young people. The young retaliate by criticizing the older ones. Neither believes the other. The credibility gap in our denomination is one of the widest. Somehow, you see, because of the strong emphasis on legalism, that you must do this or you're not accepted in our churches, in our homes, in our schools for many, many years. And then they lack of the knowledge of Christ and his righteousness and saving grace. And the lack of emphasis in that has put every child in a dilemma. How do you perform without Jesus? How do you live these even poor standards, if you want to call them that, without Christ? Well, a strong will can. They can give at least an external appearance of righteousness. But there are many weak-willed among us, and they cannot. And there is a difference between strong will and weak will. A tremendous difference. The strong will cannot change the heart. They can just polish the outside. But don't step on their toes because they bite. It's still the same on the inside. So it doesn't matter your strong will weak weak will, the inside is still the same. And as you see in your life these many failures that parents and teachers and pastors have taught you for years are failures and are sin, you become more and more discouraged and you want to quit. And you feel condemned over and over and over again. Why do you want to be condemned all the time? You don't. So you don't like Sabbath school. You don't like church, you don't like Bible class because they're always sticking you. You know what's wrong with you. And so whenever you go home, you retaliate by finding fault with those at home who find fault or against the establishment or whatever you want to call it. And there's a reaction to this critical attitude, this legalistic emphasis and crisis emphasis so often. Then when we find young people justifying their sins to protect themselves, and it is a defense measure, by the way, to protect themselves, then the older ones say, whores, you know, now look what they're doing. They know I do what's wrong, but they justify what's wrong. That's a deeper level of sin, they say. They may become even more extreme in the legalistic criticism and more conservative, you want to call it that. And so they part ways farther and farther away, both believing themselves to be right. Neither one believing that there's anything wrong with self. You can't criticize the group in our homes anymore. You can't even tell them there's anything wrong with them because they've been told that so many, many times they want to fight with you. In fact, they like to punch you in the nose. At least silence you so they never hear you again. So we don't talk about sin anymore. We have other names for it. We don't even talk about the other names for it anymore. Just leave everything out of that. And to protect ourselves and to find some hope, we've joined some groups now where we tell each other how good they are. Where we emphasize self-love and self-achievement. And someone says, you know, I think you're a pretty good fellow. You do so and so and so and so. And we try to pick them up off the floor like gum has been there for 20 years, you know, and tramped upon. And they like that. But they like something more because it's not the Lord telling them he's happy with them. And they know that. 
They don't want to go home, they don't want to go to church, and they don't want to go to school because everybody's telling them what's wrong. And so they can't not bear to see the nothingness of self. They're too much of a failure. Dad, mother, the preacher, the teacher told them for many years. And the older people who found the wrong, they said, don't go that way. It's just ultimate permissiveness. You just do everything wrong. And they say, it's okay. And so they believe they're right. And the young believe they're right. And the devil laughs and laughs and laughs and laughs. Oh, we all say we're right. Friends, I honestly believe that's happening every day. And it's been going on for a long time. How can the Lord tell us that he wants to bless us? That he has tremendous righteousness to give us as a free gift. That all the deficiencies, all the weakness, all the inadequacies, all the ineffectiveness, he can take care of the whole thing. But not until you acknowledge your need, your own nothingness, will you ever depend upon him. And he must tell you you're hungry. You're needy. He must accept it. But we become so defensive, you know. No matter which posture you take or which position, they will never listen. And God has never been involved in this fight. And he's not involved in this credibility gap. It's always been our misunderstandings and our misrepresentations our misinterpretation. He's not critical like we are. He doesn't point the finger and denounce an exact performance. He's never done that. But we have done it as pastors and parents and teachers. This is not the voice of God denouncing, not at all. He has a still small voice. He speaks as like he did to Nicodemus and to Moses and to David. See how delicately he pointed out to them. He was very, very careful he wouldn't crush out the only spark of hope we have as he pointed out our deficiencies. He literally is saying, you know, why will you die in your sins? Why will you die with all those things when I can take them away and make you so perfect. When I can make you like Jesus. Why will you go on and on and on perpetuating these problems? I believe with all my heart that the Lord this very day wants to bridge all these credibility gaps. And he wants them to look into every heart, not just the young. He wants to look into preachers' hearts. He wants to look into administrators' hearts. He wants to look into teachers' hearts. He wants to show us our sham, our phoniness, our corruption. He wants to show us how we've misled people. He wants to look in parents' hearts. But he doesn't want them to give up. He doesn't want them to commit suicide. He doesn't want to go around blaming themselves like a flagellante or something. He doesn't want that at all. He wants us to turn to him and depend on him for the strength and the righteousness that we do not have in ourselves. And he's been waiting all these years to bless Seventh-day Adventists with his power and his spirit and his love and his righteousness. And we go on defending ourselves as though there were nothing wrong with us. Oh, friends, forget the voices of many humans who are doing so much fault-finding and so much excusing and justifying. We're accountable for one voice, the voice of God's spirit. And he's speaking to me as he did to Nicodemus and to you. And he's saying, except you be born again. Except these blemishes and cancers be taken out of your life. Except you be all new. Wholly dependent upon me. You can't get in the kingdom, but I want you there. That's why I died for you. Oh, friend, give me your heart. Trust in me. Lean on me. It doesn't matter how useless you are. I can make you mighty. I can bless you. I can make you even like the Son of God, Jesus. And to all I'll be able to say then, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. May the Lord by his sweet grace somehow penetrate into our hearts and minds and take away all this defense, all this self-justification and to see what Christ is really trying to do for us. This is my prayer for you in Jesus' name. Thank you.